morning, guys. Guys, don't forget that the uh, the quiz is going to be on Thursday, and it'll be the same format as what we've had before, where um, where we'll come into class on Thursday, and then in the last 20 or to 20 25 minutes or so of class, we'll have the quiz. It'll be 10 to 15 questions, multiple choice. Um, I would read the chapters, read the notes, work through the examples, and work through the homework. So your homework and the examples will be very similar to the problems that you'll have on the quiz. And then also there will just be some basic knowledge about, you know, what are the laws of uh, Newton's laws, his first, second, and third laws. You should be aware of those. Uh, what are the different types of energy, uh, power that we're going to get into today. Um, the, this concept of inertia, center of mass, uh, a little bit of vector stuff. We work through those problems on vectors in class. So just being able to graphically add vectors like we did. Um, the concept of friction, the difference between static and kinetic friction, normal forces, uh, tension, the, uh, the different types of muscles, the flexor, extensor, tendal, tendons, uh, the sphincter muscle, and then the different traction systems, maybe being able to calculate the forces on a traction system. We had a homework problem similar to that. And then for energy, which we're doing now, uh, the different types of energy, uh, we'll do conservation of energy, but then also kinetic energy, potential energy, uh, thermal energy, which we're going to get into a bit today, uh, chemical energy, and how it applies to our body, like with calories and the consumption of food. We're going to talk today also about the basal anabolic rate and how your body consumes power and what that means. So all those things will be in there. We'll probably finish the chapter today and um, begin the next chapter next time. But that next chapter, chapter 5, won't be on the quiz. Any questions about the quiz? No? All right. Did you have a good weekend? Yeah? It's all right? I know it's a busy week for everybody. It's sort of a, a crunch time for everybody because everybody's giving exams. So, uh, you know, try to prepare early for this quiz. Go ahead and start reviewing over your notes. Just spend 20 minutes a day is better than nothing. It's better, too, than just cramming all at the very end, okay? All righty. I want to start, uh, we talked about how energy can change, like, for example, with friction. If you have friction, often your kinetic energy is converted into what type of friction? Or into what type of energy? If I have friction, like with my hands, and I rub them together, what type of energy is it converted into? Thermal, right. It heats up my hands. Uh, I have a little clip. This is a, a guy that wrote about the physics of basketball. He wrote a book. And he's talking about basketball and, and how the, the state of the ball changes. Um, it's an audio clip. It's just a minute or so. All right, so he's just saying that as you're dribbling this ball, you have this kinetic energy that you're putting into the ball, and then as it touches the floor and the friction from the floor, it actually causes the temperature of this ball to increase. So converting that kinetic energy or that, uh, that energy due to the frictional forces into thermal energy. See, last time we left off, we were just starting with uh, chemical energy and the concept of food energy. Does anybody know what a calorie is, by the way? Do you all know how 
we define what a calorie is? We'll see this in just a bit, but what is it? That's right, Faith. It's the amount of energy required to heat one gram of water one degree Celsius. And that's how we define what a, what a calorie is. Not a food calorie, because remember, a food calorie is how many calories? Like when we talk about calorie, the energy required to, to heat one gram of water one degree Celsius, that's a calorie, lowercase c calorie. But when we talk about food calories, that's equivalent to how many calories? What? It's written on the board, I think. Okay, that's in joules, but yeah, uh, I'm looking for a food calorie. When we talk about calories, it's actually a thousand physics calories, as I say. We'll see that in a minute. So the energy content of food is in uh, kilocalories. Let's work an example, and then I have a clip. Uh, actually, let me show you this first. This is from the Mayo Clinic. There are a lot of these on the Internet, just trying to figure out how many calories you use in a day for a given person, because different people don't use the same amount of calories every day. And so this is a calorie counter. It's from the Mayo Clinic. And uh, it just asks you to put in particular information. I'll just do myself. I'm 36. I'm 6 foot zero inches, and I'm about I don't know, 165 or so male. And what other things are, like first of all, the amount of calories that you use is, a, is dependent upon your size and are you male or female. What else would it be dependent upon? The amount of calories that you should intake, right? Your activity. And so that's the next thing. And that's usually all they ask in these things is what is your age? Why is your age important? Right, because as you get older, what we call the basal metabolic rate uh, actually begins to decrease. So just sitting around, you use fewer calories than you do if you're younger. So younger people tend to burn calories more uh, readily. And then so the next thing, uh, ask you to describe your activity level. I'm probably, I have at least 30 minutes of moderate activity. And then, da da da, -da you want to see? All right. So I should be eating 2,550 calories. And so that's just sort of my, that's what I need in order to function on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can see here that if you're, you have different levels of calories, like if you're very active, then you need about 400 extra calories. So what's 400? That's like, I don't know, a hamburger or whatever. Uh, or if I'm just somewhat active, then it drops by a couple hundred calories. Or if I'm inactive completely, then it drops by about 450 calories. All right, so that's a, a calorie calculator, and there are a whole bunch on the Internet, and they sort of use slightly different ways of calculating them. We'll come back to that in just a minute. I have a, an audio clip from a, a podcast about this where they, they talk about this in greater depth. Let's work an example, though. A person requires 3,000 kilocalories. Now, remember, this is the food calories that we see on our, our packages of food. Uh, 3,000 kilocalories a day. Uh, but consumes 4,000 calories. Uh, how long must the person cycle in order to use these extra thousand calories? And different uh, Different activities use different numbers of calories, require different amounts of energy. 
So I'm looking at table 4.2. This is in your book. You'll need it for the uh, for the homework as well. But it's on page 75 in your book, and it just gives estimates of the amount of energy that's required for different activities. So for example, when you're sleeping, anybody guess how many calories you use when you're sleeping every minute? What? Yeah, not enough. <laughs> you use about one kilocalorie per minute. So, you know, if you sleep eight hours, that's what, uh, eight times, it's about 480 calories that you use while you're sleeping. So that's like a hamburger, right? I think I, like a small hamburger, like one of those little bitty kids burgers from McDonald's. I think that's probably about 400 calories. Uh, standing relaxed is about two kilocalories per minute. But if you're cycling at about 13 to 18 kilometers per hour, that's, it's on page 75 in your book. And guys, on the quiz, you know, I've been pulling data from a variety of tables in your book. I'll just photocopy these tables and I'll put them at the end of your quiz. So you'll have all this information, but you need to be familiar with it and just know how to use it and what, why it's useful. Um, let's see, so I'm looking at cycling. It uses about 5.7 kilocalories per minute. So this person that consumes an extra 1,000 calories cycling uses 5.7 kilocalories per minute, so about uh, five times what you do when you're sleeping. And so if I want to know how much extra time, I have this extra calories of 1,000 kilocalories that I want to burn off. And so I divide this by 5.7 kilocalories per minute. And notice how my units work here. The kilocalories cancel out, and then the minutes, which is in the denominator of the denominator, it flips back up and becomes minutes. So this uh, 1,000 over 5.7 is 175 minutes, which is uh, almost three hours, two hours and 55 minutes. So if you consume that extra 1,000 calories every day, and I give, and on any given day if you do that, it's not a big deal, but if you do it every day, then it, this person at least would require about three hours extra activity to help use up that energy. All right, I have a little uh, audio clip. This is from iTunes. She's talking about, you know, it's not really this simple, this whole idea of consuming and burning calories. Like different people can be a lot different. And the amount of calories that you burn that your body uses uh, can be quite a bit different depending upon who you are and, and your age and sort of how you're built. So let's listen to this. It's just a few minutes long. from uh, the Nutrition Diva. You ever heard of this? Quick and Dirty Tips. It's very interesting.
times a week, I get emails from readers who want me to tell them exactly how many calories they can eat in order to maintain their weight or lose a certain amount of weight. Unfortunately, the only way to really find that out would be to go to a research laboratory and spend 24 hours in a special chamber or wearing a mask or hood that measures your actual energy expenditure as you go through your daily activities. For most of us, this is obviously not practical. And even though this might give you a much more accurate answer than the formula, it's still only a snapshot of a single day. Remember, your metabolism is affected by many things, including diet, age, body composition, even how hot or cold the environment is. And I've talked about many of these factors in previous podcasts. For example, increasing the amount of protein in your diet can cause you to burn a few extra calories. Engaging in serious weight training and building up bigger muscles would also increase the amount of calories you burn in a 24-hour period. People who are naturally fidgety burn substantially more calories than people who aren't. But I've never seen a calculator that asks you how fidgety you are if you turning down the thermostat a degree or two would increase your energy expenditure. As we get older, however, our metabolism tends to slow down, meaning that we burn fewer calories than a younger person. The impact of any one of these factors is going to be fairly small. But when you consider all the variables, you can see that any numbers spit out by an online calculator can only be a very loose estimate of your actual energy expenditure on any given day. Now, I don't know if this next piece of news makes the situation better or worse, but those calculators that tell you how many calories are in your food aren't really any more accurate than the ones that calculate how many calories you burn. You can look up exactly how many calories are in an egg or a bunch of broccoli, but this number is merely an estimate. It's based on the average number of calories in representative samples. But remember, just like people, the plants and animals that provide our food are unique organisms. The amount of sugar in an apple or the amount of protein or starch in a grain is going to depend on the variety, how warm or wet or dry the season was, how early or late they were harvested, quality of the soil, not to mention just random genetic variation. Likewise, the amount of fat in the steak will depend on the feed and the particular type of livestock, the health of the herd, and the weather. Even the calories listed on the nutrition facts label of your breakfast cereal or your energy bar is a ballpark number. Legally, that number can be off by as much as 20% and still be in compliance with the rules. By the way, this podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Did y'all want to hear the ad for Audible and all the shopping and stuff? No. Okay, I guess. Let me take that away. Well, actually, in the next chapter, we'll talk about how they determine the caloric content of foods. It's fairly interesting. They'll, they use a, a calorimeter or a bomb calorimeter, and they take it and put it in this chamber, and they explode it, and then they measure the change in temperature for the food. Have you all ever seen this before? It's pretty cool. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in the next chapter. All right. Um, We're going to skip, if you're following along in your book, we're going to skip electrical energy and light energy and mass energy. So if you're following along in your book, that's pages uh, 75, 76, and 77. We're going to move straight on to conservation of energy. This is a pretty big topic in any physics course, and it's very important in a lot of physical uh, calculations that we make. The conservation of energy. And it just says that the total energy in a closed system uh, is always the same. Somebody remind me what a closed system is. I talked about this earlier. What is a closed system? I'll write it on the board. 
How do you define what a closed system is? What's that? You don't know. Okay. Let's go down your rest. You know, yeah. All right, a closed system is just a system where there's no energy going into it and there's no energy going out of it. Sorry. No energy going in, no energy going out. I think we just mentioned it in passing before. There's actually one or two questions in your homework about closed systems. Let me just write this uh, the board. A closed system has no energy going in. and no energy going out. So any energy that it has is just being converted from one type of energy to another. So remember the, the car, the wind-up car, where you wind it up, and then you have that closed system, and it has all that potential energy in it, that uh, elastic potential energy. You have that spring that's all wound up. Uh, when you let the car go, what is that energy converted into? What type of energy? It's moving, the energy of motion, kinetic energy, right. So that's a closed system wherein the, uh, the total amount of energy is not changing, but that elastic potential energy that you get when you wind it up is being converted then to kinetic energy. All right, so we can write this, this idea of conservation of energy. We're going to uh, constrain it only to kinetic energy and potential energy. Let me just write these just to remind you. Kinetic energy is for motion. And for potential energy, uh, this is based on an object's position. So for example, if I have a block right here, it has a certain amount of potential energy. I'll call it potential energy 1. But then if I raise the block to a higher position, it has potential energy 2. And the potential energy at the top is going to be greater than the potential energy at the bottom. And we developed an expression for this last time. And it's that the gravitational potential energy is equal to the force weight times the height of the object. All right, so if I have an object and I lift it a certain distance from the, the surface of the Earth, it has the potential for motion, right? Because if I let it go, it falls down to the ground, right? But if I have it at a smaller height above the Earth, it has more or less potential for motion. It has less potential because if I drop it, it's not going nearly as fast as if I dropped it from up here, right? It has more potential for motion. We can calculate that amount of energy is just mgh. Uh, don't forget also that kinetic energy We've seen this before, and this will be on your equation sheet, but it's one-half mv squared. Uh, I'll post the equation sheet that you'll have for the quiz on Thursday and send it to you over email. All right, so the conservation of energy just says that the energy initial is equal to the energy final, and then we make up these energies in this way, that the kinetic energy initial plus the potential energy initial is going to equal the kinetic energy final plus the potential energy final. Let's do an example. Uh, this is example 4.10 from your, from your uh, book. You'll find some similar to it in the homework as well. well let's just pick a problem from the book. I'll do a different problem. Um, this isn't a homework problem, but we'll just use it to do. Let's do problem number 4.17. This is from the problems at the back of the book. Right, but it's not given as a homework question, but it's similar to some of the homework questions. It says, uh, using energy considerations and neglecting air resistance, calculate how far a rock will rise above its point of release if it is tossed straight up with an initial speed of 10 meters per second. So what I have is I have a guy, or a lady, and he takes a rock and he throws it up in the air. It goes up in the air and then it comes back down. 
And I want to know what is this height that it goes up into the air. The only information that I'm given is that down here at the bottom, you throw this rock up with a velocity equal to 10 meters per second. And I want to know what height it goes up into the, into the air. Now, I'm going to consider two positions in this trajectory. I'm going to consider this position, and I'll call this my initial position. And then I'm going to consider this position, and I'll call that my final position. And then you want to ask yourself, what types of energy does the rock have at those two different positions? So in the initial position of kinetic and potential, what type of energy does the rock have? Just as it leaves its hand, what type of energy does it have? OK, we're taking that to be zero level. All right, so he's basically throwing it from ground level. He throws it up in the air. Just as it leaves its hand, what type of energy? Right, it only has kinetic. So we're saying that the potential energy is zero there, because we're saying that the height is zero. All right, I understand what you're thinking, that, that he's, he's sort of holding it right here. Yeah, so we're going to take that as our zero. We'll see that. That's fairly common in these types of problems. And I'll work this one, then I'll work another one, too. All right, so at the bottom, he only has potential energy. What about at the top? What type of energy does he have? He's going to have potential energy. And what about his kinetic energy? What is the kinetic energy of the rock at the very top of the trajectory? What? Why is it zero? Right, very good. So the ball, when it goes up to the top of the trajectory, it stops. So it's not moving. So it has no kinetic energy. So at the bottom, it has a speed of 10 meters per second. And we're going to take the position to be zero. So it has no potential energy. And it has only kinetic energy. And at the top, in the final position, uh, the speed goes to zero. Remember, and we talked about in chapter two, I think it was, when you throw something up in the air, it decelerates until it gets to the top, and then it stops for just an instant before it turns around and comes back down again. So it has a velocity of zero, and so it has no kinetic energy, all right, and it has only potential energy. So we can take our conservation of energy and say that EI is equal to EF. EI consists of both potential and kinetic energy. And EF consists of both potential and kinetic energy. But we said that for both of these, there's no potential in the initial state, and there's no kinetic in the final state. So from this conservation of energy, we have this expression, that the kinetic energy, that's 1 half m v i squared is equal to mg times h. And I want to know what is h. I'm going to give you all a minute. I want you to try solving for h, solving this expression for h. Uh, in general, whenever you're dealing with something like this, you want to make one side of it to have just the h. So what you do here is you would divide both sides by m and g, m and g. And then that cancels out the M and G on the right-hand side and leaves you just with H. So just take a moment and try to solve for H. I want to know what is H. And then go ahead and calculate it. I'll give you about a minute and a half or so, two minutes.
my number yet? You have a number. Number yet? Tyler, right? Is it Tyler? Okay, the number yet? Guys, we're just going to divide both sides by M and C. We're going to get something like this. We'll work through another example, but I'm going to divide both sides by M and G. M and G. So that cancels out the masses over here, and it cancels out G over here as well. It also cancels out the mass over here. And then I'm left with an expression, 1 half vi squared divided by g is equal to h. Anytime you encounter an expression like that or an equation, you just want to divide both sides so that you get, or change both sides, do the same thing to both sides until you get the variable that you want by itself. Uh, so I can put in some values here. That's 1 half of v, which is 10 meters per second squared over g, which was 10 meters per second squared. Uh, so that's half of 100, which is 50, over 10, which is 5 meters. Very likely to have a, a question similar to this on the test, or uh, the quiz on Thursday, OK? A conservation of energy problem. We're going to work through one other one just now. Uh, that's sort of doing the reverse. That is, instead of finding the, the height, we're going to find the initial speed, All right? So conservation of energy says that in a closed system, that total amount of energy is always the same. So for example here, he had a certain amount of energy at the beginning, and that same amount of energy he still has at the end, All right? And so we can use that fact to, to find a lot of things about the motion of this object. For the next one, I have a little clip. This is a, a clip that was sort of viral on YouTube for a while. I think it's kind of fun. And it's these guys that are throwing this woman up through the air. I want to find out or estimate what speed does she have as she goes up into the air. So let's watch this first. And think about what's the information that you need in order to find her speed as she goes up through the air, the speed that they throw her up with. It's kind of rock and music, too. Let me uh... All right, so what's the information that I need in order to find her speed? Let me just draw a picture first. So I have, uh, this is my basketball goal. A young lady here. She's really tall. Uh, she goes up in the air, and then she comes back down. And I want to know what, what speed, what is her initial velocity at the bottom? What are some key pieces of information that I need to know in order to find that speed? Why don't y'all try this anyway, the Nichols cheerleaders? You think they could do that? You throw Amber or Alexa for somebody up in the air like that? Through the basketball goal? No, OK. Yeah. All right, so what, what information do we need? You think so? All right, what else do you think we need? The height of the goal? Yeah. I want to know, uh, does she go as high as the goal or higher? She goes higher. So I always want to know their maximum height, right? All right? So let's see. She has a certain amount of energy at the bottom. What does this energy consist of, potential or kinetic, at the bottom? It only consists of kinetic energy because we're going to take her height equal to zero. And then at the top, she only has potential energy. And we're going to call this h, the height. And so we need to know what the height is. Um, I think I estimated it. How, how high do you think it is? How high does she go? How many meters? 
How many feet? Okay, yeah, maybe five meters, about 15 feet or so. Peter's about three feet. So uh, we'll say that our maximum height was about 15 feet. We're going to just estimate that to say it's roughly five meters. All right, we might need to know her mass. We'll see. I'm going to say it's 50 kilograms. She might be a little less than 50, uh, but we'll see. Now, I'm going to take my kinetic energy initial and set it equivalent to my potential energy final. So kinetic energy initial is equal to my potential energy final. Remember, kinetic energy is one-half mv squared, and this is m times g times h. And I want to know what v is. Now take just a moment, see if you can find v. Notice, by the way, here, what happens to the masses? They cancel out. So you don't really need to know the mass. It could be, you know, this tiny little 40-kilogram lady, or it could be like a 200-pound guy that you're throwing up into the air. And as far as energy is concerned, it doesn't really matter. So the masses cancel. I'm looking for V. Probably need a calculator for that. No, you don't. So here when you're solving this, you want to try to get that V isolated all by itself. So you're going to divide both sides by one half M so that over here the M's cancel and the one halves cancel. And you have a one half M over here. And notice that the M's cancel. If I take this one half and bring it up to the numerator, it's going to be 2GH. What else do I have to do to this to find V? I'll take the square root of it. So I say the square root of V squared is equal to the square root of 2GH. And that gives me my expression for V, 2GH. Anybody have the number for that? It's easy, right? What is it? It's 100. Uh, 2 times 10 meters per second squared times h, which was 5 meters. Well, that can't be right. Can I do that right? Oh, yeah, square root of, yes, thank you. Uh, the square root of 2gh. So that's the square root of 100, which is equal to 10 meters per second. Yeah, 100 meters per second, that would be hella fast. All right, 10 meters per second. Uh, 45 miles an hour is about, or 45 meters per second is 100 miles an hour. So that's uh, about 20, 25 miles an hour. She's booking it, going up. All right, there's a lot of cool physics in that. We'll get into it a little bit later with rotation and what have you. Uh, the things that she's doing when she goes up into the air in later chapters, we'll talk about that. All right, there are some homework questions regarding to conservation of energy. And I, I would certainly expect at least one question on the test that's a calculation type problem similar to this, where I have this energy that's being converted from one type to another and finding either the height or the speed of that object, okay? As well as just conceptual questions about what is energy and uh, this idea that within a closed system that you have a constant amount of energy, that it always stays the same, all right? good practice in the homework. It's good practice for the uh, test. Also, these examples are good practice for the test. All right. Um, I meant to show you all a video in the previous chapter. I want to show it to you now. Uh, I, I hate to change topics like this, but we're about to move into a new topic. So let's just take a moment uh, to step back to Newton's laws. And uh, I want to show you this video. The NFL put out this series of videos about the physics of football, and there's some really nice things there. 
So I want to share this with you. This is on Newton's second law and how it relates to uh, kicking. So let's watch this, and then we'll move on to power, which is in chapter 4. Um, the units of this are the what? The what? What? <laughs> okay, uh, the what? And one watt in SI units is one joule per second. Uh, it's a name, person's name, so when we abbreviate the watt, it's a capital W. Uh, it's after James Watt. You don't need to know this name, but uh, he was a physicist in the 1700s. Sort to give you some framework. Um, and so this describes the power of a lot of different things. Like we see the power described for vehicles, for cars. They, they put out a certain amount of energy per unit time. We also see it for electrical devices. Have you ever seen the, the tag on the back of your electrical devices that have the power rating? You've seen those before on the back. It might be like a radio is maybe 10 or 30 watts. A light bulb can be 60 to 100 watts. Uh, a hair dryer, does anybody have any idea how much energy a hair dryer uses, the power rating? It's like 1,000 to 2,000 watts. It's probably the, the most energy consuming device in your whole house. A blow dryer, a hair dryer, apart from your big appliances like your clothes dryer and your, your oven and stuff like that, your, your hair dryer. I've been trying to cut back on drying my hair as much as possible, but I just walk around with like wet hair all day, so I'm sorry if that offends y'all. What? Yeah, girls. All right, so uh, the units of power in watts, it describes the power of electrical devices. Uh, cars, for example, engines, cars as engines. So usually with car engines, we express power in another unit. Do you all know what that is? <laughs> horsepower, yeah, horsepower. So horsepower, that was just a little hint for you. Um, any type of mechanical device. All right, let's do an example. Can I go down from here? I'll give you a second. Let's see, have I told you all the fish joke? I told you, what, did the, uh, what did the fish say when he ran into the concrete wall? And then you say, I don't know what. Damn. You get it? Dam? Like, oh, there's a dam right there? Ha, ha, ha. I think the best jokes you don't get right away. It takes a minute for you to think about it. All right. Can I go down from here now? All right. Let's do an example. We'll be using one of the tables in your book. Um, what power is generated? Oh, no, no table. I'm sorry. What power is generated? By a 60 kilogram person. Climbing two meter high stairs. Climbing stairs. Two meters in height. Uh, in six seconds. All right, now remember, power is equal to work over time, or energy over time. What is the change in energy for this person climbing two meters high in uh, these two meter stairs? This 60 kilogram person climbing two meter high stairs. So I have this person. Yep. 
They're climbing stairs that are about two meters high. So my height here is two meters. And I want to know, first of all, what is the energy or what is the work that's done when this person goes from here up to here? And I can find that. You can think about it in two different ways. Uh, you can think about it in terms of potential energy, that down here is potential energy is zero, and up here is potential energy is mgh. So I'll, I'll think about it that way first. And so the amount of energy that he gains is mgh, right, because I've increased my potential energy from zero at the bottom of the stairs to some non-zero non value at the top divided by the time. And then it's just a matter of plugging in the numbers. So I have uh, 60 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared times h, which was 2 meters, divided by the time. So I want to know the power. And that's 6 seconds. So that is uh, gives me a value of 600, 100, 200 watts. Right, so this person burns uh, 600, 1,200 joules going from the bottom of the stairs to the top of the stairs. Now, given that's an underestimate, why would I say that it's an underestimate? Because the person is actually using more energy than that, right? Because he's losing energy due to friction between him and the stairs, losing due to energy due to friction just within his own body. So that's an underestimate for the amount of energy. Us. That, that's the numerator, 60 times 10 times 2, which is 1,200, and then divided by 6 gives me the power, the amount of power that you use. Yeah, David? So that was the whole work energy theorem, that any time I can think energy as well. Let's get out of how we're approaching this from the idea of energy, but we can think of it too from a standpoint of work. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, she asked on that previous problem that we did, where he threw the rock up in the air. Uh, he says that you don't get that there's no that there's no potential energy that there's only kinetic. When we're, because when it's in his hand, it's not moving, right? And so it has no kinetic energy. That's what you're thinking, right? The potential energy is zero. Let me go back to that on the slide, okay? Everybody okay with this for now? All right, I'm going to step back just a few slides. It's a good question, so I just want to make sure that it's clear to everybody. Uh, that was this question. He has no potential energy, only kinetic energy. Whenever we're working these problems, we always sort of set our coordinate system or set our frame. So I'm going to call this position h equals 0. And then this position up here, we found h to be 5. So really, our initial point, our lowest point, we're always going to say that that's 0. And so at 0 point, that's where we have no potential energy. Potential energy really is a relative thing. Like I'm really only comparing two different places. And so, like, if I call this zero, then I have more potential energy up here. I have less potential energy here. Right, I'm getting to that. So the other thing is is the, uh, the idea that we're not thinking of the ball when it's sitting resting in his hand. We're thinking of, or in this case it was a stone, we're thinking of the stone right after he leaves his hand. So there's a moment right after you let it go when it leaves your hand and it has a certain velocity. So whenever we're talking about these things, that's what we're considering is the moment after it leaves its hand. Does that answer your question? Right. 
Right. We're not looking at it right here. We're looking at it right here, right after it leaves its hand. And then it has that maximum velocity. That's a great question. Is that, is that clear? Uh -huh. But it only has energy, but I don't understand that either. It's just okay. Well, when it goes up to the top of the trajectory, when we're doing free fall problems, the velocity of the object goes to zero. Can I throw your calculator up in there? I won't count that, I promise. All right. So look, if I, if I throw this up in the air, it stops right up at the top. I throw it up, and then it stops just for an instant. If you're stopping, then you have no kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, and so there's no kinetic energy. All right? But we had energy at the bottom, and so all of that energy has to be converted into something at the top. And the something that it's converted to is the gravitational potential energy. That's right. But I don't understand how it has kinetic energy when it's still in the person's hand. Okay, because we're not talking about when it's in the person's hand. We're only considering right after it leaves the person's hand. So the person's hand is, is no longer influencing the rock. We're just thinking about right after it leaves its hand, then that's when its velocity is at its maximum. That's, that's sort of the, I know that doesn't make sense because we normally wouldn't think of something in that way, but we are thinking about it in this way, that, that right after the stone leaves its hand, that's our initial condition, that's our initial state. All right. The hand doesn't have to be there. All right. It's really just this rock has a certain velocity at the bottom, at the top it has no velocity, and then it returns back to the bottom. The hand is just sort of a side effect. All right, that's a good question. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear with that. Everybody okay? All right. All right. We're going to look at work and energy in human beings. We'll touch on uh, metabolic rates and how we burn, how we exercise, and how we burn energy and what have you. Um, so work, energy, and power in humans. There's a section in your book on this. Uh, we're going to talk about metabolic rates. Metabolic rates describe how quickly How quickly we convert food energy to some other form. Whether it be converted into, you know, sort of running our body or the kinetic energy that we do when we when we move or when we exercise or thermal energy when our when our uh, bodies are heated up. We have the basal metabolic rate. You'll need to know what the definition of this is. The uh, basal metabolic rate, or the BMR, you'll probably know what this is, but it is the uh, total energy conversion. for a body at rest. There are some homework questions regarding this. Uh, in your homework questions, you'll be using the table on page 89 that describes, I thought it was very interesting actually, on page 89, which describes how different parts of your body use different amounts of energy. So for example, do you know what 
which organ in your body uses the most energy while you're at rest? Do y'all know? Huh? It is the liver. The liver and the spleen use uh, almost a third or about a quarter of your total energy just while you're at rest. And then do you know what's next? This is interesting. After the liver? The what? It is your brain. Goodness face. It's your brain. And then after the brain comes the skeletal system, the muscles, and then after that's the kidney, and then the heart just uses a very small amount, like uh, that's just a tiny little fraction, about 10% or less. All right, so you'll use this table, uh, which describes how much energy per amount of time, the power consumption that your organs use in one of your homework problems. And just describes the basal metabolic rate. I have a little video that talks about basal metabolic rate. Let me write this down. The, uh, the liver and spleen use the most energy. That's at rest. When you're at rest, um, followed by the brain, followed by the skeletal system, skeletal muscles. All right, let's watch this video. It's just like a little cartoon video, but I think it's pretty good. It's about basal metabolic rate. All right, so they sort of uh, they sort of paint this picture of BMR being very simple, right? But uh, as we heard in the other podcast, the BMR is quite uh, dependent upon a lot of things, like do you fidget a lot or or just for what is the makeup of your body? What is your body made up of? Um, let's do an example. How many grams of fat? So an idle person gain in a day by consuming 2,500 kilocalories of food. So if you look at that table on page 89, uh, it gives the amount of energy that a resting person needs. And a resting person needs 1.22 kilocalories per minute. 1.22 kilocalories per minute. And so, uh, if I convert this into a full day, like I want to know how many, how much it needs for a day, I'll say that uh, in one minute there are, or excuse me, in one hour there are 60 minutes. So I just want to convert this into days. And then in one day there are 24 hours. And so that gives me the total amount of calories that they need for the day. This is just sitting around, which is 1757 kilocalories per day. That's one of the most fascinating things to me is that, I mean, so much of your energy consumption that you need isn't really based on your activity. Like most of it's just based on who you are, that this person needs 1,800 kilocalories per day. But remember the recommendation, say if this was a man, they recommend 2,500 kilocalories. That's not a whole lot more. That's only about 700 more calories. So anyway, uh, they're consuming 2,500 kilocalories. And they only need 17, I'll just go ahead and call it 1,800 kilocalories for a day just for sitting around if you're idle. Uh, and so the difference in that is 700 kilocalories. And now if you look on uh, table 
it allows you to convert some of this into grams of fat. This is on page 74. Uh, And it says that there are 9.3 in one gram of fat. We have 9.3 uh, kilocalories. So now we can convert the 700 kilocalories into how many grams of fat it has. So uh, there are 9.3 kilocalories in one gram of fat. And so that's 700 divided by 9.3. I get uh, 75 grams of fat. 75 grams. Or about an eleventh or so of a kilogram. All right. Uh, we just have a few minutes. A little video I wanted to show y'all. Uh, let me just show you one other thing, and then I'll let you go. And then I'll show you the video next time about uh, the NFL and how they how they advise their athletes for for nutrition. Um, they've alluded to this, but the BMR varies with mass. So does a bigger person or a taller person have a lower or a higher BMR? Like for, is my BMR bigger or smaller than a person that's like four foot tall? I have a much bigger, I have a higher BMR. And that, that holds not just across humans, but across all creatures. And I think that's very interesting. If you create a graph, now this is a log log graph, so it increases by factors of 10. If you don't remember what log is, don't worry about that. But uh, but this is a log of the BMR versus the log of the mass. If we plot this, it's a straight line. It looks like this. So that we have, over this wide spectrum of masses, the BMR increases with mass by orders of magnitude. So like down here, for example, we might have a rat with a very small mass and a very small BMR. So they just don't need much, many calories just to exist. Right? And then up here, far removed from the rat, is the man. And the BMR is bigger, but not as big as, say, a cow, which has a bigger mass, or an elephant, which has an even bigger mass. Um, so within mammals, at least, this BMR varies with mass. So as your mass increases, no matter what kind of creature you are, a mammal, then your BMR is going to increase as well. And this has been shown fairly clearly to be a a very linear relationship like this when you plot the log versus log, which is means that you increase by factors of 10. All right, guys, uh, the quiz will be on Thursday, and I'll have some review time before that. So if you have questions, you can bring them then. It's going to be on chapters 3 and 4. All right, there'll be about 10 to 15 questions. All right, if you all have questions, I'm around. Uh, today and tomorrow. I might have to go out. Oh, actually, no, tomorrow afternoon I'm out. So if you have questions, try to come see me today or tomorrow morning between 8.30 and 9.30, or send me an email. I can often address your questions over email. All righty? All right, guys, well, I'll see you on Thursday. Please bring a Scantron, OK? And I'll be sending out your equation sheet soon, today or, or early tomorrow. See you.